I call this meeting of the Conroe Independent School District Board of Trustees to order. Let the record show that a quorum of its members is present, that this meeting has been duly called, and that the notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code 551. The time is 6 o'clock p.m. Item 1A, invocation, um, if you will. Mr. Moore? Yes. If you are so inclined and are comfortable doing so, would you please bow with me? God of grace and mercy, we have gathered here tonight from different places with different ideas, just as we know you by different names and understand you in different ways. But we come here together seeking a common goal, to do what is right and what is good for our stakeholders, for our students, for our employees, and for this community. We pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to your will, that we would take our oaths as sacred duties to serve this community, to set our will and our agenda aside and do what is best for the greater good. We offer our prayers to you in all ways at all times. Amen. Amen. I don't want to be pledged, Mr. Hubert. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now the Texas flag. Honor the Texas, 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 Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God, one indivisible. Thank you, Mr. Huber. Mr. Moore. Um, item 2A, citizen, citizens participation. Ms. Godfrey, has anyone registered to address the board? Yes, they have. Okay. The next 30 minutes has been designated for public participation by patrons who have signed up to address the board in accordance with board policy BED. Please remember that the board may not discuss or act upon any issues that are not posted on our agenda. The board has adopted complaint policies that are designated to secure at the lowest administrative level, level a prompt and equitable resolution of complaints and concerns. These policies provide that if a resolution cannot be reached administratively, the person may appeal the administrative decision to the board as a, post, a properly posted agenda item. Copies of the district's complaint policies can be found on the district's website. Those who have registered who have registered to address the board will be limited to five minute presentations for their will be limited to five minutes for their presentation. Delegations of more than five must appoint a representative to present their board their views to the board. Ms. Godfrey, please call your first person who signed up to address the board. Kelly Cook. Good evening. Can, is this thing working? Okay. Um, good evening, CISD board members. My name is Kelly Cook, and I'm here today to encourage you to hold off on calling a bond until a few other matters are settled. Taxpayers are anxiously awaiting the budget hearing outcomes to see if they will be allowed to reap some of the rewards of the statewide property tax reform bill. Many of us fought tooth and nail for this. First, uh, by adding it to the Republican Party platform, the language urging the state to use a surplus revenue to buy down the school's m and tax rate. Then we worked to make it a reality in the 86th legislative session with many trips to Austin. And word on the street is folks will be getting a much needed tax break finally, because that is what the state intended and the grassroots demanded. You can join in the effort to make this a reality or you can stand in the way. If CISD board members adopt a rate that is above the effective tax rate of 1.234, more money will be collected than last year and people will be writing bigger checks again. The statewide property tax relief will be gobbled up. The plans to raise the INS rate before the bond so you can claim the new bond won't raise taxes is not entirely truthful, but a preemptive strike. <coughs> the fund balance money could be used instead, of the ser instead to service the debt and you could leave the rate at 22. That would actually offer real tax relief. Here's your opportunity to earn the trust of the community. Tax rates are only half of the equation. The other half is the predatory appraisal boards to whom CISD have the majority of the seats. 
are people to expect their appraisals to go up another six to seven percent again. This is the reason taxpayers from all over the county care about this issue. This is why volunteers from Willis, Montgomery East County and Magnolia came to <coughs> out to work to defeat the last bond. CISD's influence on the appraisal board are dragging up appraisals all over and people are sick and tired of it. Another thing to consider is all the taxed enough already voters are going to be out in force to defeat the statewide income tax referendum in November. The Children's Hope Pack and all volunteers that were attracted to the effort to rein in the school district's budgets who impose the lion's share of property taxes will be out again if this bond is called before you get the budget kinks worked out and you prohibit the tax relief the state intended. It appears you're rushing to call the bond before you finish the budget hearings and before the new bond transparency bill, SB 30, takes effect on September 1st. That would force the districts to disclose much more information to the voters at the ballot box, such as taxes sufficient to pay the principal and interest on the debt. In closing, I hope you will consider not calling a bond until after the budget hearings are completed next week and you have figured out a way for folks to get the property tax relief the state intended and wait until SB 30 takes effect in two weeks so the voters will have a more transparent bond process. Informed voters make better decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Godfrey. John Wirtz. <clears throat> Good evening, President Williams, members of the board, Dr. Knoll, and ladies and gentlemen. My name is John Wirtz. I'm the vetting committee chair of the Montgomery County Tea Party and treasurer of the Montgomery County Republican Party. I am speaking on behalf of myself this evening. Back in May, I came before you after the defeat of the first May 4th bond. Then as now, I expressed shock at how high the $807 million bond was, especially since this was on the hills of $350 million plus bond four short years ago, bringing CISD debt to 1.3 billion. As I talk to many voters out there in my capacity, they ask sim really simple questions, like if we're 1.3 billion in debt, why on earth do we already need to spend another $807 million? Or in this case, 670 million plus <clears throat> already. Where did that bond money go? And our tax dollars go? Right now, our county is carrying over $6 billion in debt that's with a B, capital B. When is enough enough? I know that Dr. Noel is relatively new and that he's not really responsible for what happened before he got here. But save for Director Edmund, all of you are. The previous bond, when I researched it, is something I would have been embarrassed to stand behind, as I told you. But judging by the fact that not much has changed between $807 million and now, what you guys are deciding on, not much has changed. While you may have separated AstroTurf out into another proposal and m and into another cost structure, you still have huge capital items that aren't necessarily needed now. For instance, three new elementary schools that aren't needed for five years. And on top of that, each cost on average of $10 million more. That's 40% more than elementary schools that were built two short years ago. Look, we know the game that's played between tax rates, even lower runs, and increased appraisals on our homes, resulting <clears throat> at the end of the day in bigger checks that we have to write uh, from our checking accounts into your coffers. As far as we're concerned, any increase in any tax rates, particularly the effective tax rate, and specifically the debt service tax rate is unacceptable. Dell's not here, but Ray, Scooter, we at Montgomery County Tea Party supported all three of you guys the last go around. I trust you'll be true to the taxpayer and go back to the drawing board again. Thank you. Stuart Lapp. Good evening, Mr. President, Mr. Superintendent, board members. <clears throat> My name is Stuart Lapp. I am a citizen of Montgomery County. I'm a lawyer, managing partner at the law firm of Stibbs & Co., a business law firm 
in this county. I have been actively involved with economic development in this county for many years. I've served on the board of directors of the Woodlands Area Economic Development Partnership and served as chairman of that board. I have served on the board of directors of the Woodlands Area Chamber of Commerce and am currently the chairman of the board. Um, but I'm here today in my capacity as an individual citizen to address the board and I encourage you to call the bond election. The reason I encourage you to call that bond election is that the Conroe Independent School District is a vitally important asset for our community in attracting business to this community. And I can tell you from personal experience that when business leaders and businesses are determining whether to relocate their operations into this county, one of the very first questions they ask are, how are the schools? And we as stewards of the business community have the pleasure of saying the schools are great. And the reason the schools are great is because this school board has historically championed the rights of students, kept tax rates low, and been responsible stewards of taxpayer money to build the schools. I encourage you to continue to do that. I want to share with you a recent experience I had uh, an opportunity to be in a, um, a meeting with um, the, the CEO and chairman of the board of Occidental Petroleum. And as many of you know, Occidental has recently uh, voted to acquire uh, Anadarko. And one of the questions, and, and Dr. Noel, you were at this meeting, one of the questions that, that the, the CEO asked right off the bat was, how are the schools? And we had the opportunity to, to share with her how the schools were. And I think that that was one of the many things that was impressive in being able to give that presentation to the chairman of board of, of Oxy. Um, and we've seen recently that, that uh, uh, the vote to, for Oxy to acquire Anadarko uh, proceeded. Oxy has announced that they are not vacating the headquarters uh, in the Woodlands, but is, is uh, keeping those people there. And I submit to you that one of the reasons that that happened, like many of the other businesses that make decisions to locate to this geographic part of the country, is because of the schools. And so for those reasons, I encourage you to continue to be good stewards of the taxpayers' money, continue to, to look closely at what the needs of this school district are, and to call the bond election. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, sir. Linda Nelson. <clears throat> Good evening. Um, I am the vice chair elect for the Woodlands Area Chamber. I work at Memorial Hermann the Woodlands Hospital for 23 years. Moved to uh, my home in the Woodlands in 92, so I've been around a really long time. I had the honor of serving on the facilities planning committee, so I spent almost 30 hours touring many different uh, facilities throughout my, the CISD areas. I heard so many impressive presentations about the bus barn, about the technology, about safety and security. <clears throat> so I do support this bond 100%, but the two things I think we really need to focus on, it's the growth and it's the safety. We heard the four-year demographic study in detail, what's going on east of us and north of us. If we don't start planning that now, this zoning is going to affect everyone in the schools that we have here. But the main thing is the safety. We just saw what happened in two places in the United States. When we toured Conroe High School, there are 100 entrances into the high school, 100. So when you see schools that have one entrance and they can go through a metal detector, I even said to uh, Dr. Knoll, I said, we shouldn't even have security here. There is no way that we could ever efficiently take care of the students up there. So for those two reasons, I, I encourage you very much to call this bond. Thank you. Thank you. Eric Yalek. <clears throat> sure. Three handouts. 
My name is Eric Yalik. Uh, I have absolutely no qualifications. I think y'all are familiar with the fact that I never learned how to write. Um, and I live in the woodlands right across the street from the ninth grade campus. I ask for your blessing in one of two ways today. The first way that I think that you could bless me and the other citizens of this county is to vote no on a bond order. Now, I want to be clear. Y'all aren't fooling anybody. And specifically, I'm referring to the chief financial officer of Con Conroe ISD. You're moving money around in order to cause our debt service tax rate to increase enough so that you don't have to campaign on raising the tax rate as part of the bond election. And that is very, very clear. Now, the reason that you should be aware that you do not have to do what you are doing with respect to the debt service tax rate is that if you look at the statute, and now I've given a copy of the statute to all of you, it's under 1.007 of House Bill 3 that Governor Abbott signed into law, and it makes it very clear that the only thing you are prohibited from doing is increasing the maintenance and operations tax rate for the purpose of paying down debt service. You can do anything else. If you have cash fund balance, you can use that money to pay down debt service. But instead, what this district is doing is you are purposefully raising the tax rate higher than even you promised that it would be. Now, what am I talking about? Let me ask you to look at the second handout. And the second handout is the tax rate chart, which I got from Conroe ISD's bond website. And y'all projected in this chart what the tax rate for debt service would be if the bond passed or if it didn't pass. And you said very clearly at the top of this chart that the tax rate would be 0.24 per $100 valuation. Now, I want to point out that Dr. Null even presented this chart on Monday, the April the 15th. And that's an important date. Because by Monday, the 8th, April the 15th, we already knew that House Bill 3 was going to contain the language that I put in front of you. We already all knew that this maintenance tax limit was going to be in the bill. And yet Dr. Null was still presenting this chart at the presentation that I saw him do personally at Oak Ridge High School. Now, if all of what you're saying is true, there is no reason to increase the debt service tax rate above, and you know, I've said to some of y'all, I think it should stay at 22 cents per $100 valuation. But even you're saying that it only needs to be 24 cents per $100 valuation. The only reason you're gonna raise it to 26.5 is so that then you don't have to put a tax rate increase on the bond referendum. Y'all aren't fooling me, and you're not gonna fool anybody, because I'll tell you something. The one thing I'm going to do, and the one thing you can count on, is that I'm crazy enough to sell metal, and I'll spend $100,000, and I'll get the message out to the voters what y'all are doing if you put a bond election on and you claim that there's no tax increase with it. Now, the only other thing I want to say is this. Stuart Lapp just said that he wants you to call a bond election. Well, bond elections should be truthful. They should be truthful that you're calling a tax rate increase that you're actually doing by fiat in advance as part of your budget next week when you pass a budget. And we all know what you're going to do next week, just like we all know what you're probably going to do tonight. You're not going to put a bond in front of the voters. All you're going to do is put half the bond in front of the voters because the voters will never be given the opportunity to vote on the tax increase part of the bond. Now, the last thing I want to say is this. If you're not going to bless us by voting no on this bond, the one thing you are going to do for me is you're going to bless me because you're going to give me the opportunity to work with those people back there, Kelly Cook, Andy Delaflore, John Wirtz, Bill Brenza, and Jenny Stevenson. And you're going to help us build the largest organization of grassroots conservatives this county has ever seen, and we're going to be ready for 2020. 
we'll beat you on November the 5th, and we'll beat you in May of next year, and we'll beat you in November of next year. So let's get going. Thanks. Andy, Andy De La Flor. <clears throat> Hello, board. Uh, I might be uh, fairly new to the uh, subject with the school district, uh, district and your interest in them raising the bond and uh, bringing the bond before the people. I think I've heard on several occasions that uh, the board was uh, interested in hearing what the uh, people have to say. So as a resident in Montgomery County and also uh, uh, previously a student, I could tell you that uh, raising the tax rate, uh, it does actually affect the uh, the residents here uh, a lot a lot of the residents that are uh, living here are um, their their income status reaches you know uh, a lower income um, I know uh, as a student for a long time I uh, was uh, struggled to you know pay bills and things and as a property owner as well I had had to pay my taxes as I was a student uh, now that I have a student debt and I pay it off as I can um, I have uh, some debt that is part of my student education that is maybe possibly um, a result of remedial classes that maybe I wasn't able to receive uh, or other students in our district wasn't able to receive through the education they're getting um, at your, in your district. So uh, while you're raising the taxes or you're raising the rate of the taxes, um, whatever that might be, and uh, putting a, a large amount of debt on the taxpayers. Um, a lot of people can't afford uh, that, especially students or past students that are still trying to pay off their student, student loans and student debt, including teachers in your district that, are, that own property that are still paying off student loans. Um, I think that um, there's probably a lot of constituents in the school district uh, itself, obviously, that um, struggle with taxes. So. Um, we want to see the teachers get paid, at least I do. I'd like to see the teachers get paid better uh, and have, obviously have qualified teachers. But um, also we would like to uh, honor the uh, work that we put in to try to get the taxes in Texas lowered, um, maybe even uh, respect what the governor already legislated. And uh, let's just, what I'm saying is just hold off on the bond proposal, at least um, to respect some of the uh, some of the uh, voters that are not, uh, they're not ready for that. And maybe they want a more transparent uh, referendum <clears throat> coming uh, up in election in uh, November. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Melanie Bush. really weird being on this side of the podium. <laughs> as many of you know, I served as a CISD Board of Trustee before being elected County Treasurer. And I know how tough this job really is. I also founded and operated a financial services company. And those experiences have given me great insight into Conroe ISD and into its needs and the best method to pay for those needs. So I'm here to express kudos to this board for your resilience. I know this hasn't been an easy year. <coughs> After the May bond failed, this board picked itself up and immediately began to think outside of the box. You thought about what the voters said. You listened to what they said in May and their concerns. And I'm here to applaud you for that because it's not easy. It'd be real easy to let ego get in the way of that and to not listen. It's so obvious that you've listened. You've examined every aspect of the May bond. You've crafted a new bond issue that aligns with what you were told in the May bond was what was wanted. It's also clear that you've been determined to keep the facilities at the first rate level in the face of the exponential growth of our district and student numbers, included in this is high level improvements, new schools, and I have to give you kudos for that. School districts like ours have to work extra hard to stay on top. 
And as a parent of students in this district, I appreciate that we do stay on top with first rate education. As an experienced financial professional, I definitely comprehend the purpose of bond issuance. They're reserved for major projects. And our district's growth rate creates a need for those type of projects. If we weren't growing, we wouldn't need these things to the level that we do. And of course, the most cost effective method of financing major building projects is the issuance of bonds at a reasonable rate. And much like a small business like mine would finance a new office building when we're growing with a mortgage. I believe that with the new bond content, voters will understand these improvements are exactly the sort of major projects appropriate for bond financing. Finally, it is vital that we keep our schools at the level we currently enjoy, at the high level, in order to attract business, yes, but more importantly, and what has been the focus of this board while I was on it, to train skilled workers, to have adults that are productive members of society at 18, whether that is them going on to college or into a skilled trade that is much needed in our economy today. All the while, this district has kept our school property taxes as low as possible, currently the lowest in this county. In my professional opinion, the school district must continue to keep the quality of our education and facilities at the level they are. And I want to ex express my appreciation to this board for continuing to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That is all. All right, Ms. Gonfer, thank you. All right, gentlemen, item um, three, consent agenda. Receive and consider approval. I'm sorry. Are we okay, we're okay with the consent agenda, Dr. Noll? Yes. Okay. Receive, um, consider approval, human resources report, employment of professional personnel, as well as consider approval of minutes on the consent agenda. And no one has reached out to me to remove any item or discuss any further. I'd move approval of consent agenda as presented. A second. I have a motion. I have a second. Gentlemen, any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Motion passes. All right. Item four, receive <coughs> proposed contingency plan. If a bond election is not called for November 2019 or if called, fails to pass. Dr. No. All right. This time I'll ask Dr. Hines to come forward and present that plan. Good evening, President Williams, members of the board, Dr. Noll. Uh, to meet the needs of its growing student population, the district must continue to expand its physical capacity to serve new students, as well as to maintain its existing facilities. And certainly we've been doing our best to enroll as many students as possible the last few days for our first day of school tomorrow. Uh, to, to do this, the district's administration has developed a five-year bond plan to meet the district's need, and we will later on be recommending uh, the details of that to the Board of Trustees to call for a bond election in November. However, if the Board chooses not to call a bond for November 2019, or if the Board does call a bond and it is not approved by voters, uh, the district's immediate needs will still need to be met. Administration has developed a contingency plan to meet the most immediate of the district's needs Specifically, the district must add temporary classroom space and maintain its transportation fleet, maintain its classroom technology and network infrastructure, make continued improvements related to safety and security, sustain roof and air conditioning replacement cycles, and continue to plan for needed future facilities. Uh, and so just want to just touch on a few of those brief uh, items. And again, we anticipate just, again, we can do as much or as little uh, in the plan as we need to, um, but we're looking at um, first year, we anticipate about $25 million and um, I'd really like to target for the areas of safety and security. Uh, that include, that, that really just means continuing our plan 
uh, to look at door, uh, address alarms, door hardware, camera replacement upgrades, uh, digital radios, and uh, exterior door sensors and control access. Also, we want to look at our uh, need for replacement of HVAC and roofs. Uh, our infrastructure for technology has to be sustained. That includes uh, roughly right now 6,700 iPad 2s. Uh, we have several Windows 7 machines that will continue through that cycle. Uh, we will continue to need to replace uh, and add to portables because we have <coughs> classrooms, so we'll just need to do that. We're planning for that. We also will continue to grow, so we need buses. Um, we'll need new buses. Again, we have a, an aging fleet as well as adding new routes each year. Uh, and then we'd like to continue to, um, if we don't do a bond, we still want to plan for the future because the future is coming. So uh, we would still want to set aside some funds for some design work as well as um, land uh, acquisition for some areas that we know we're going to need some schools in the future. So those are some of the just outward uh, approaching needs that we'll want to meet. Um, and then we've just kind of looked at ways and um, possibilities for proposed alternatives to generate funds to address these current major needs, such as uh, we could, and it certainly be an option to look at a potential increase of the maintenance and operation tax rate. We could uh, have a targeted hiring freeze, and I use targeted there because I don't think it's reasonable to think we could totally freeze hiring, but there'll be some positions we'll have to add. Um, staff to, we could staff decrease or increase our class size ratios. That's one way that we can generate some savings. Uh, as I mentioned, um, I think about a month ago, we're locked in at the 22 to one in elementary. We have done waivers before, um, but certainly it'd be mostly impacted at grades five and up. Uh, we could do, um, the, we could eliminate the 1920 plan to, uh, or possible employee retention stipend. We could have um, minimal or no salary increases in the future, depending on what we're able to do. Um, we could reallocate or eliminate that capital maintenance fund that I know we've been planning. Um, delay the start of full day pre-K is another option. And um, general budget decrease across all departments and campuses. We've also uh, shared with you previously, and we'll, we're looking at uh, several rezoning solutions to try to maximize uh, some areas. Uh, that would involve changing our high school zones. I just wanted to be upfront about that in several areas, as well as we would lose some of our pure uh, feeder zones for the junior high. So those are just some of the highlights of the things that we've talked about that we know we'll need to keep working on, uh, as well as some possible ways to set aside funds to pay for it. Thank you, Mr. Hines. Gentlemen, any questions? Concern? My question one of them says delay start of full day pre K. How, how long could we actually? I mean, is, is that not state mandated that we have to have full day pre K? It is. So there's a, I mean, we're, we're, we'll probably apply for a waiver this first year, and that's a three year, I think it's a three year waiver, and then we could delay it up to three years. Uh, the other option is the partial. You know, we just add a few campuses and then bring on some more later. So those are, you know, all of the above. This year we're piloting two, two schools. Mm -hmm. And so right now our plans are really in our planning stages. We're looking at um, bringing on as many as we can next year. Um, but space comes, becomes an issue at some point that we'll have to take into consideration what we can and can't do. And that's really been the challenge with the all day pre-K. Um, what it's doing is taking a group of students that were there just half a day and now we're, we're going to have them all day. So in essence, we've actually decreased our capacity in, in our elementary schools. Okay. Let me ask another question here. Staffing decrease and increased class size ratios. So are there any, are there any studies out there that show what the, um, what, what, what's the wheelhouse for student to teacher ratio and, and where are we with that? And if we, if we, if we were to increase class size ratio, are there any long-term effects of education for these kids? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, it's, it, you know, definitely there's some porting research that class size negatively impacts uh, the quality of education. That Across students, the board? From Across the board. It's actually, or... it's actually more so at the elementary than the secondary levels, which is why we carry a lower um, ratio. student ratio in, in state required at the elementary level. But certainly... 
um, the challenges become um, what we use for staffing ratios is just a, is a formula driven that generates a, a certain number of teachers for a campus based on a certain number of enrollment. And so when we raise, if we raise that number of students per teacher, it will, um, it'll just decrease the number of positions you have. And for uh, large schools, as you know, it just means you have less flexibility. And certainly there's, there's room in there for programs and, and what we have to look at in terms of staffing. We did this district-wide about 12 years ago on a pretty large scale. Uh, it's one of those things where I hate to say we've already taken a lot of that savings. We did it previously uh, when we raised class ratios at the high school levels and the, and the junior high levels uh, several years ago. And um, so we'd be doing it again, but we would look at ways of just trying to save money. And that's really what it comes down to is you just raise the ratio of, of the number of students that generates a teacher unit for a school. That's got to affect education. But it's not a positive thing. It, it impacts your schedule. It's, no, it's 22 to one. Yeah, I mean, right. right. I'm sorry? It's not by accident, but it's at 22 to 1. No, sir. You, you done? Yes, sir. I know you can't possibly tell me what the effects of this would be, but um, I want you to give me two solid scenarios of high of, of pure high school, junior high feeder zones being broken. And if, as if we had voted on it, give me two examples of, <clears throat> I think I know one that involves irons, but go ahead. Well, I mean, certainly where our, our, our first, our first challenge is Moorhead junior high. Yes. So uh, we don't have any more capacity. So we're looking at options there. And that would either involve bringing students over to Suchma or bringing students to Irons. Uh, and so that's, or that's, both. or both. And certainly that's, that's an option uh, that we're looking at. And the other, the other scenario is what are we going to do for York? And, and York is fast growing. Um, they're, they're going to be over 1600 plus this year. Uh, and they've been growing about a hundred a year. And so we, we know at some point they'll level off, but we're just trying to make it and, um, for a few years. So I think York is another one of those that we've looked at different solutions for, whether that involves irons or whether it involves Knox. Um, but certainly that would change their feeder zone. So that's another example of somebody leaving that feeder zone for junior high. Okay. Now, now give me an example of a high school, you know, where you're out of capacity. And so you, okay. Oh, that's it's okay. Good. No, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I just want to make sure I didn't step on just uh, where, you know, let's just say it's College Park that's over full. So you're going to take some uh, kids and put them somewhere else or Conroe or wherever. I mean, wh whichever one it is. Just is. I'm just looking for a couple of real life examples yeah. so I understand this what is, we're talking about here. This is okay. an example. I think we shared this in one of the workshops of um, the um, in this in this particular map is one where we brought over. Uh, the areas that are Harper's Landing, which currently goes to College Park and to Oak Ridge uh, feeder zone, as well as uh, this area, which currently goes to Conroe High School, we brought those into Oak Ridge. Um, and then we moved uh, what is some of this area up here, which is Carriage Hills and Stillwater over into College Park. Um, and then we brought up. But but if you do that, then, then they're gonna switch junior highs and high schools, and it'll be a permanent fix. Correct. We, we Whereas think, if you take Moorhead students and send them to Irons, they're going to go back, back to Candy Creek. Yes, sir. That's the examples I'm looking at. Yeah, that's... Where you're going to take kids out of the feeder zone and then put them back at the high school with people they used to know. Correct. Okay, that, two years separated. Yeah. That, is there another one of those besides the Moorhead? Just Moorhead and, and York are those two. And then these, this represents really just a way, and we can align junior highs very similarly to match. So for South County, we could. We could yeah, that, that's uh, arguably maybe way that should have been to start with. But anyway, that's the end of the day and the But thank you for using those examples for me. Okay. And I just had a quick, quick follow up yes, to that. That raised some concern yesterday for me is, you know, we're talking about hiring freeze and increasing the ratio. Um, but I was talking with the junior high special needs teacher, and apparently those classes are also gaining capacity. And that's sometimes we 
forget about the needs there. What happens if there's just not enough teachers for a school with special needs? Would we have to distribute those children as well? It's a really good question. I, I think we've, we use ratios for our special needs classes just as we do for our general ed classes. And so those are certainly adjustable and they could be adjusted. Um, we're going to meet our students' needs and we're going to, we're going to provide the free and appropriate education for our students. So we're going to have programs and, and we're going to staff them to make them work. Um, but to answer that question, could we adjust ratios in that area? The answer is yes, we could. Um, and those are the decisions that would have to be looked at and planned out carefully. But um, I think we've had a history and um, we understand why we're here. We're here to serve our students. And so we're going to do whatever we need to do to make it work. And I want to stress that, that if we, we need people in there, we will have people in there. So we'll make it work. Dr. Hines, do we post that, those slides? We, ha we haven't posted the slides. Okay. Dr. Hines, if we implemented full day pre-K tomorrow, how many additional classrooms would we have to have ready? So roughly about 50. About 50. We'll look at Debbie, it's about 50. So that's 50 teachers as well, right? We anticipate more children but involved this full day. Okay. So it could be more than that. So 50 classrooms is another school, right? Correct. Absolutely. Okay. 50, it's a good, good analogy. It's about so another basically school. one elementary added. Yes, sir. And the, even though it would be it'd be distributed, but distributed. it'd be it'd be equivalent of about an elementary school. That's what I was ask is are they all in one area or are they throughout the district? They're throughout the district. So would we have to bus them as well? Well that that to accomplish it at some of our schools currently, yes, because we're at capacity or over capacity. And so we would not be able to, to implement an all day pre K program at that school without either bringing in additional portable classrooms or busing students to another location. So additional bus routes as well, which we already have, we already struggle filling every bus route as it is Correct. already. And that's one of the challenges. It's certainly one of the options that we're looking at right now. It's kind of a hybrid, which is where we have room, we would go to all day and where we don't, we, we would maybe combine it with a school that had capacity. All right. Thank you, Dr. Thank Sir. Dr. Thank Dr. you. Gentlemen. Doing good, thank you. All right, um, item seven, legal, Dr. No. All right, 7A, uh, student code of conduct, Ms. Gladys. Thank you, Dr. No. As you know, every year we, um, particularly after a legislative session, we have to update our code of conduct, and we did that this year. Um, the state law requires that it go to the Fiscal and Planning and Decision Making Committee, which it did. And I outlined for you the, the changes, which really are minimal, um, to the code of conduct for this coming school year that we're proposing. Um, they've added some more factors that we need to consider when assigning discipline, whether or not the student is homeless or whether or not the student is in the conservatorship of the Department of Family and Protective Services. Um, we've also added language based on statutory language requiring that we will give students access to curriculum regardless of their disciplinary placement and have make that available to them. Um, there was a statute dealing with inversive techniques, none of which we use in Connor ISD, but we've added the language that is required for that, prohibiting those techniques being used to discipline students. Um, and also um, a provision in the code to establish the threat assessment teams envisioned by Senate Bill 11 is included in this. Um, the duties of our police officers and then um, some updates to the harassment statute uh, required adding some language about what would be a mandatory BAP placement for students in certain circumstances. And those are really the changes that we're recommending to the code of conduct for next year or tomorrow. Starting tomorrow. Thank you. All right. 7B, consider order. Dr. We need a motion. We need, we need a motion. We need a motion yeah, I move that we adopt uh, the student code of conduct as presented. I'll second it. Gentlemen, I have a motion. I have a second. Do we have any discussion regarding the student code of conduct? Hearing none, all in favor? Motion passes. Thank you. Now, item 7B, uh, consider ordering a bond election for November 5th, 2019. Dr. No. Thank you, President Williams. Um, I know that this is a topic that you all have spent hours uh, in personal deliberation on. We've also had uh, the opportunity to work through this in workshop form, but uh, tonight I'd like to present to you just a composite view of uh, what we would bring forth for your uh, consideration tonight. 
this process started after the May election. Um, one of the things that, uh, through your direction, we vowed to do was to listen to the community, to seek out input. Um, that process uh, occurred throughout the summer. We had small group meetings of many different private individuals that were non-related that came into small groups. We I met with uh, some groups of folks, uh, met with many people that are in this room tonight to hear those opinions. And what I've uh, done this evening is combined uh, uh, a lot of that feedback into just a summary of uh, what I would consider to be the constructive criticism that we gained and advice that the community had for us as um, things to consider in moving forward. So uh, first was that, uh, as Mr. Wirtz mentioned in his uh, comments this evening, that the overall amount of 807 million was staggering to some people in our community. It was it was um, seemed to be high. Um, there was a concern about uh, the last bond package being a four year package and, and we were right back in four years. It seemed fast to some people to already be back. Um, we heard advice about using some of our fund balance that we had in order to reduce the amount that we needed to, to uh, finance, to use more cash on hand. Um, we heard that there were too many maintenance items in the last bond package. Uh, artificial turf was a polarizing uh, item in the package. I heard very strong feelings uh, against artificial turf, heard very strong feelings for artificial turf uh, from different people. <coughs> Um, it was stressed that we need to find a number that would, would not generate a tax rate increase. Uh, tighten the package wherever possible. It's another piece of advice that came from the community. Reduce spending on technology devices out of bond funds was a suggestion. Don't finance short life items with long-term bonds was a uh, suggestion. And then how do we minimize the impact on our residents that are 65 and over in the community? So as a result, uh, I want to just kind of go line by line and tell you exactly how we have responded to the community in this bond package. The overall amount was overwhelming to some voters. Uh, Proposition A in this package is now $153 million less than the $807 million in the previous package. So a $153 million reduction. Increase the time between bond <coughs> referendums. The May proposition um, was considered a four year package. We are now recommending a five year package um, in this proposal. Uh, and just to speak to that overall dollar amount, the four year package at 807 million uh, was averaged out to be a $201 million expenditure per year as part of that bond. This new recommendation that you will receive tonight is a $130 million per year annual expenditure. So $70 million per year less than the previous bond um, proposal. <clears throat> we need to use cash on hand to reduce debt. $35 million in cash uh, from the fund balance will be utilized. At this point, you have already authorized $20 million, uh, $10 million to seed the capital maintenance fund eight and a half million dollars for land and one point five million dollars for buses. Those are all uh, will cover items that will be removed from the previous bond. Additionally, uh, 15 million more dollars from the fund balance to move into technology to allow us to pay cash for technology. Too many maintenance items in the bond. The capital maintenance funds was established through your ten million dollar um, seeding from the fund balance. But additionally, you have committed through the uh, budget process to send $10 million a year um, to the capital maintenance fund. Over the life of this bond, that will allow us to take $50 million of maintenance items out of the bond. And I would remind you that that $10 million is the money that previously you would use to buy down the tax rate on the debt service side. So that money now will be moving to the capital maintenance fund and allow us to pay cash and not incur any debt for those items. Artificial turf is a polarizing item in the package. Um, therefore, uh, we would recommend that turf stand alone as a Proposition B to give voters the choice. If they would like to support turf or not, it will be a standalone item for their option. No tax rate increase. If both approve Propositions A and B 
will both be approved and it will not result in a tax rate increase. Tighten the package wherever possible. We've removed the following facilities from this uh, bond proposal, the teacher training center, the ag facility, maintenance facility, Hawk renovations, and the jet center um, renovations have all been removed from the bond package. Reduce spending on technology devices out of bond funds. There'll be no technology devices bought. Uh, the $5 million that remains in the bond package for technology is infrastructure spending. Don't finance short um, life items with long-term bonds. All technology, so the five million of technology, and then all <coughs> buses will be paid off within 10 years. So, so those items will be financed on a 10 year timeline. Minimize the impact to residents 65 and over. CSD residents that are 65 and over have their tax bill frozen when they meet 65. So regardless of uh, any additional tax rate uh, their tax bill is frozen. Even if their house appraisal goes up, their school district tax bill is frozen. Additionally, um, we provide an additional $15,000 homestead exemption for our residents 65 and over. I believe that the law requires us to have a $10,000 homestead exemption and we do an additional 5,000 for, for those residents that are 65 and over. So let's look at the highlights of the bond package. It's a no tax rate increase package. Uh, it is a five year um, bond package. Safety and security enhancements for every campus. Five new schools, that's one additional elementary school than, than was in the previous bond package. And the, the reason for that is twofold. One, we have extended out a year. So we look one year further out into growth. Uh, but additionally, as you talk to Dr. Hines about, the uh, addition of full day pre-K um, was not a conversation when the last bond package was approved. Uh, and now we understand the need for at least 50 more classrooms for pre-K. Uh, we have additions of more capacity at nine campuses. That's 6,800 new seats total for students for growth. Major renovations at two of our high schools, uh, Conroe High School, and at Oak Ridge High School. Oak Ridge High School is a primarily mechanical renovation. Uh, Conroe High School does address the need that was mentioned tonight in citizens participation about reducing the number of uh, exterior doors that would bring uh, that campus all under one roof. Um, that affects 5,500 students, those, those two jobs. Renovations at campuses, those are um, primarily mechanical. They're often, um, the most common item on that list is is full HVAC uh, replacement. That's oftentimes new chillers and new ductwork. It's not maintenance on the current facilities. For example, I was speaking with Marshall earlier today. Uh, in the past six days, we have um, we have changed five compressors with this heat. Um, about a little over two hundred thousand dollars we've spent. That's maintenance. Um, we've done that. We do that out of our maintenance budget. This is full cell replacement of the. Um, of the existing machinery. Uh, new buses, all our new buses that we purchase have air conditioning uh, as well as seat belts and then a facility expansion to uh, allow us a place to park these buses and to maintain the buses. And then proposition B, artificial turf at the high schools. So just to bring this uh, forward for you to highlight, um, 315.8 million for new campuses and additions, 240 million for campus renovations, 29 million for land and contingency, 25 million for support service needs and 45 million for safety and security. And then Prop B, 23.8 for artificial turf. And just to break down the line items, and I'll also just speak here to another question that was brought up. Um, the cost of construction. Uh, all elementary campuses in this plan uh, are anticipated to follow the same exact floor plan and design that the elementaries in, the, in this previous bond program have followed. So we will open such elementary tomorrow. We would anticipate that elementary 45 through 48 would follow that, that same floor plan, no changes. Uh, the uh, cost escalation for construction in the Houston market right now is estimated at 6% annually. 
So that is what you see here reflected in these numbers is a 6% annual ex escalation of the cost from what it costs us to build um, Clark and then Suchma uh, and the annual 6% escalation. Uh, we will certainly work to build these campuses cheaper. If we are capable of doing that, if the cost um, doesn't see that 6% escalation, and let's say, for example, we were able to build elementary 48 for 35 million, then that would allow us to just not sell that additional $4.4 million in bonds and we would never incur that debt. So we will work certainly to, to um, get the best pricing possible. Uh, what we've not wanted to do is what we've seen other school districts get themselves in a situation before where they've uh, made a promise to their voters that a campus would be built and they reached the end of their bond and they were out of funds and unable to complete the projects. Um, so while we wanna be conservative and, and try to be as tight as we can on our estimations, we do not wanna be short because we can always not sell the bond and realize the savings um, through that. I'm just speaking through this rather quickly as you see the line items, you see the new schools, uh, the, uh, the addition of that junior high, or the, I'm sorry, the new school that's been added from the last package is the elementary number 48 in the Caney Creek feeder. Um, that's based on anticipated growth. Once again, um, that's a forecasted school. It's forecasted five to six years out from today. If we don't uh, have the growth and that school is not necessary, it will not be built. Um, it'll be built when it's needed. Uh, the junior high and Caney Creek feeder will provide um, for relief, uh, not only for Moorhead Junior High, but also for Grangerland Intermediate as we convert that school back to an intermediate school. Additions at uh, each of the high schools in the Woodlands to uh, really serve the capacity which they currently serve and get them from portable buildings and also add some um, new science place to the Woodlands High School that was not, uh, was not needed when it was built. It was, it was, uh, it's just changed. The schooling has changed now. Um, the South County Career and Technical Education Hub at Oak Ridge High School for our career and technical. The junior high addition at York, as Dr. Hines mentioned, um, their growth. Conroe High School ninth grade addition. The elementary P classroom additions to Runyon, Wilkerson, and Collins, which also um, expand the capacity of those buildings. It allows the other classrooms to be used more often um, because it gives an option for PE during the lunch hour. So uh, it, does, it would actually increase the capacity of the buildings as well. Uh, as we mentioned, Conroe High School and Oak Ridge High School. Campus renovations, as we spoke of, are primarily HVAC projects um, throughout the, the district. Safety and security touches every single campus uh, in Conroe ISD. Um, the transportation facility, technology, buses, land, and then contingency for a total of 653.57 million and then the 23.8 million or artificial turf. But this time, I would make the recommendation um, for these two bond propositions to be included on the November ballot. Gentlemen, can I get a motion? I so move. Motion, second. I second the motion. A motion, second. Discussion. Before you go to yours, can I? Mr. Sanders? Just, sure. Oh, Ray? You mind if I I'm sorry. Uh, you? I'll, I'll yield to you. Sure. Just, just a, a quick question. Yes, sir. Uh, on, I understand on Proposition A, if there are some funds that we don't need to sell, because as you as you pointed out, if we build a school for less expense, things of that nature. Yes, sir. Would the same thing apply to the uh, Prop B as well, or would we not be allowed to do no, that? No, absolutely. If we were able to do those projects for less than what we've anticipated, it'd be the same scenario. We would, we would sell less. So if we were able to uh, if that was the pass and we were able to put the turf in for 22 million, we would do it for 22 and we would not sell that additional. We wouldn't take the, we wouldn't take the, oh, well, we've got some extra money. We can go do something. No, sir. It'd be dedicated to that project. Thank you. Mr. Sanders. All right. I'd like to make some comments. Uh, first, I'd like to commend the district facilities planning committee for their hard work in preparing for our district's future. I'd also like to commend Dr. Knoll and Mr. Rice. Uh, and all the administration for their diligent efforts in preparing for this bond election. I want you all to know that you have my sincere appreciation. Board members, I want you to know I also commend you for the long hours of work that you put in privately 
looking at all of the detail that we've been provided, attending all the board, uh, uh, the board and bond workshops that we've had, and being prepared to discuss this item tonight. The schools in our districts uh, average 28 years old. With our oldest school that we still have classes in each and every day is 93 years old. Our county is one of the fastest growing counties and so is our school district. Conroe ISD is the largest employer by far in Montgomery County. As was mentioned earlier, having good schools, meaning academic excellence and financially efficient drives economic growth. And Conroe ISD has both of those. In my detailed review of this bond, I see we're looking to add four new elementary schools, a new junior high school, additions to nine campuses, renovations at 20 campuses, all to manage the growth that is expected to occur. And we have the, the support from our uh, studies to support that. We're also adding safety and security items at campuses, including security lighting, upgraded fire alarm systems, emergency power, door sensors, and access controls to allow for our students to be safer and to allow our parents of students to feel that our district is working hard to assure their safety each and every day. Conroe ISD's tax rate compared to our peers is lower because the board chose to manage the tax rate to M&O cost only and then seek voter approval for new construction and capital projects, such as additions and renovations and larger cost items. And finally, our board has worked diligently over the past years to refinance bonds when the opportunities arose and to take advantage of lower rates without extending maturities and we've been a good steward of the district's funds and I support this bond. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sanders. Mr. Uh, Mr. Kidd. Well, like Ms. Bush said, you know, as far as listening to the voters, um, as far as talking about this, let's just take a moment and you know, we're looking at campus renovations. I mean, we're going through the elementaries and the intermediate schools, you can see in there the kitchen, the air conditioning. And we've gone over this extensively, and I understand, and I'm not, I guess, I understand Mr. Inman's not here tonight. I understand he missed the workshop as well as the previous workshop, but I, I wanted to have some, some meaningful discussion like we've, like we've had in these workshops. I mean, everybody can see that these renovations, we sharp sharpen our pencil and we addressing some real needs is there does anybody have any really concerns about these campus renovations and the necessity for those you I know i don't go ahead i don't have a concern about them but i did hear some mis uh, communication occur about them for example we're slapping a little paint and replacing ceiling tiles and carpet or flooring at conroe high school well, anybody who's been over there since the renovation has occurred, uh, just in the oldest two wings of the building, and, and what I'm saying is they did the upstairs and then now they're doing the downstairs, but those halls, uh, much like the Oak Ridge issue, those halls were very narrow in their, in their day, built in their day, okay? And weren't intended for the number of kids that are there or that have been there in the past, either one. But anybody who walks over there sees that the halls are wider. The ceiling, I think they got another foot and a half or something out of the ceiling. It, there is some real change at Conroe High School, not just superficial. The pipes had barnacles in them. They were x-rayed. They were going to burst. We did have one burst underneath the Tiger Den, which is the old library. Or when we when we were there, old guy. But anyway, my, my point is they have started to fail. The central plant was failing. And so I just simply bring up the fact that, you know, if you have questions about what's going on at Conroe High School, ask somebody who knows. Don't be, please, I just beg you, don't repeat things because they are good sound bites for your issue or mine. These are kids we're talking about. And I, I've even heard... Let's do it for the kids is a bad thing to say anymore. Well, I still don't think that's a bad thing to say, okay? My kids came through here, and unlike the young man that spoke a while ago, my kids went out of 
Conroe Independent School District prepared for the world. I graduated one with a master's degree today. That's why I was late. I apologize. But let me just tell you, I'm very proud of them, but it's because of the help of educators like Dr. Null and many of you out there that it occurred. This school district gets the job done. Some kids don't choose to do the job, and that's a sad, sad thing. But it's not that they don't get presented the opportunity for an education. Do not be confused about that. Our buildings are the best in class in the state of Texas. I know for a fact, because I'm in the business, that our insurance rates are lower than any other district in the state of Texas. Lower than any other district. And it's not fair to compare to the, the ones along the coast, but it's fair to compare to any other one. And it's because of the quality construction and the, and the maintenance that is done. So with that, I encourage the passage of this. I, I wanted to add on to the Conroe High School. I mean, it's Please. amazing. There's 27 different elevations at Conroe High School. It is not level ground. And 111 doors to the outside. And over 100 entrances. When you talk about safety and security, and you think about the, the school was built before ADA was in in effect, I mean, people that have uh, special needs or have some sort of disabilities have trouble getting around the school. And they need to have the same opportunities as everybody else needs to have. And so that was the other reason I was all in favor of that one specifically because of just bringing it up to standards that everybody should have the same opportunity because all should mean all. It doesn't matter uh, who you are. We should we should be all be the same and treat be treated the same, and so those are some other reasons that I was uh, in favor. Along with a lot of this, when you look at we're adding career and technology education, and you know not everybody that gets out of high school wants to go to college or is ready for college, and so having a skill that they can immediately take into their community and begin making a living wage, I think is important. And I think that that helps bring this about as well. Without having to bus them halfway across the county to attend a program. No. Yes, sir. We have to keep in mind what the Bond Planning Committee recommended. What, what was that number, Dr. Nall? 807. 807. Well, actually no, 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 it was before yes, that. It was. It was, it was higher than that. Yes, and for us to do all this thing down to 650, and I, mean, I still am concerned, always have been concerned. This is definitely has to be a bare bones approach to what our needs are. So I see the growth in the district. Anyone that visits our schools understand the growth of the district. It's just uh, baffling to me that um, we don't have overwhelming, undeniable, just unanimous support of this thing across the district at large if they truly understood what was at stake here. And, and that, that you asked what were my concerns, that, that, that would be my concern. Well, I mean, look at the safe, look at all the safety items. Um, does anybody have any concerns or no. thoughts or comments on the I thought safety I had, and security? Directly to your question, I was just highlighting a couple of things here. Upgrade security cameras, first responder radio, uh, amplifier, new kitchens, things like that. Also I'm reminded that our school district not only teaches, um, you know, teaches students, but we're also someone that's leaned upon uh, during disasters. For example, Hurricane Ike, did we house people in our schools? Did we have to feed them? Did we have to facilitate for those things? Yeah. What about Hurricane Harvey? Did we have any role in Hurricane Harvey? And there's not a lot of, not a lot of other places in our county that, that can turn to and that people can turn to for that type of refuge. And it's expected, I mean, it's expected on our part as well. So it, it's, I don't have any issues with any of these things. These are some bare bone, um, requirements that we need and we need to get done. So in response to your question, do I personally have any issues with the items that have been listed and how they've been outlined? And, and like you've touched on, we, this is not our first time to talk about these things. And we've had, we've had several different workshops and spent many hour out here, you know, talking about these things and have been given plenty of opportunities to voice our opinion, to get things changed so we could bring something forward and you know so this is uh I, I, as far as your question of that that's my opinion on that uh 
a very wise man uh, told me a few years ago that there are three pillars that support a strong community. Um, a good, strong faith community, a strong business community, and strong schools. Um, and I appreciate Mr. Lapp and Ms. Nelson's comments tonight about the interplay between strong schools and the strong business community. If we allow our schools to become dilapidated buildings, overcrowded places where people do not want their kids going, we're weakening the entire community. Um, we're weakening the ability of businesses and the desire of businesses to relocate here. We're weakening the ability of, uh, or the desire of people to move to this community. And when your schools get weak, your entire community gets weak. Um, and you can look around and pick, you know, probably a hundred examples around the country where Schools are, are in the gutter, crime rates are up, poverty rates are up, homeless rates are up. Um, and we're fortunate in that we have the ability to work with the business community and to help strengthen the entire community. And I think that everything that is in this bond benefits the entire community. I think one thing that's often overlooked is that we ourselves are taxpayers and we get accused of not considering hmm. the taxpayers um, viewpoints, but we ourselves are taxpayers. I mean, we see property values go up. We see, we have to write tax checks at the end of the year, just like everybody else does. Um, one of the other, uh, criticisms that's been leveled is that some of the, the previous bond was not, or did not have, um, direct educational outcomes. If a child is hot in a classroom, they're not going to be learning. If the water is not running in the bathroom, they're not going to be learning. If the school bus breaks down on the way to school and they're not there, they're not learning. And a lot of the other programs that are affected by these um, are some kids' avenues to post-secondary success, whether it's CTE programs that allow them to get a job, whether it's sports programs that for a few of them may pay for college, but for others teaches them teamwork and adaptation and makes them a marketable employee later on in life because they've learned how to, to adapt. Um, I don't see one single thing in here that does not positively affect the educational outcomes of our students and does not strengthen our schools and therefore does not strengthen our entire community. Um, I would ask one question, if I may, the 6% increase figure um, I want to be very clear, that's not a number that we came up with. That is a construction trade industry figure based on historical economic data. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. I, I want to say one more thing. I forget I don't know what you were saying, and maybe not say it as eloquently as somebody and I was talking about us blessing them or something. And I want to say that, you know, first school on the list, 1970, I walked into Armstrong Elementary in second grade and, and my point is I have been blessed I have been blessed growing up in this school district I have been blessed with two children that have grown up in the school district and all those boards before us all those superintendents before us made some difficult decisions but as like Mr. Lapp pointed out you know we are just blessed to live in the community that we live in and have the schools that we live. We're number two in the state <laughs> in financial accountability and academics, number two in the entire state of Texas. And I don't think it, it's stressed enough about how blessed we truly are. And, you know, we're just volunteers trying to do our best. That's it. And, and we are just blessed to be on this board and, and, and try to serve our kids. And um, so I feel like that those that passed before us, those that made those difficult decisions, I was in seventh grade, they built a new school down South County with an elevator in it, <laughs> Knox, <laughs> McCullough Junior High, um, in Reeves and Reeves Intermediate with open concept classrooms, all of those types of things, those boards made those decisions to invest in our children, invest in our future, and where we are, number two in the state, we are reaping those benefits. So it's us, it's our parents, it's our students, it's our community that is blessed. And 
I just want to encourage us, which I have been uh, proud of serving on this board, is one of the things, we live in a great community, and people can have differences of opinions. People can have uh, different thoughts on issues, different thoughts on the spot. But one thing we learned growing up in Conroe Independent School District was respect. And, and I'm, I'm encouraging us because you guys have helped me even when faced with you know, different things going on that we have encouraged each other to be respectful in the way that we discuss these things and respectful in the way that we, we address these issues. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just hopeful uh, that uh, we can continue to do that and, and, and no matter what we may face. Well said. Well, well said. I'd like to add I, one more thing. You want it? John, if, I don't want to cut you off. Go ahead, sir. I just said, well said. Oh, okay. Yeah. You can call the question, but no, I, I, I go ahead. I'm just kidding. Yeah, so I do have another question about this, but, but I'm, I want to make another statement because I was going to answer your question. But I, I want it, it was said that I was um, I was fairly upset when the bond failed the first time. And I, I want to clear that I, I was not upset because I represent the voters. And so if the voters didn't want the bond, that gave us an opportunity to go back. I've actually learned quite a bit and felt like I've grown to go through this process, allowed me to go back to the community, not just this board and talking about amongst the board and to Mr. Rice and everybody else who was involved with it, but I actually go out to the community and hear from from all sides. I've heard from, from people who have kids in the district. I've heard from people who don't have kids in the district. I've heard from people in the district, people who don't live in the district. I've heard from, from everybody. And, uh, you know, it, it would be nice if they were all in one room so they could hear each other talking, but unfortunately, they only get to hear their own opinion, and they think that their own opinion is the one. So, but we are burdened with bringing all that stuff together and, and coming up with a decision. So I've enjoyed this, um, learning how to cut it, uh, going through, finding out what what can be added. And the fact of the matter is, is, is the district is continuing to grow. There are needs out there. Um, so the one question I do have, uh, I want to want to kind of clear up is, and I'm not necessarily wanting to, to, to talk too much about what we're doing next week on the on, on the budget, right? But anything that happens, if this is put, if this is passed tonight, it will be on an election in November. Um, if everything, if the stars aligned for the school district to start receiving and start planning, um, would the first dollar of this be spent prior to the conclusion of the budget that we are going to be approving next week i'll, I'll defer to mr rice um maybe if you can come up and address the um maybe address what what is our bond uh, our uh, debt service requirement payment for this year and is anything from this package included in our debt service payment for this year yeah currently in the budget that that we've been discussing over the past uh, few months the the information that is provided does not contain anything concerning the bond package that you're uh, thinking about this evening. So there's nothing there. We, we, we do have debt service payments that are scheduled for, matter of fact, we have one August 15th this week, Thursday, um, and then we'll have one February 15th and then next August 15th. So that is our scheduled debt service payments uh, for next year, but they do not include anything for a potential bond. Okay. And obviously the reason I asked it because that's been brought up, hey, you know, the, the tax rate that we'll be voting on tomorrow is or next week will will include anything with this bond and it has nothing to and, do and, with and, this bond. and it needs to be said that that the formula that we're using is if we have debt service money set aside we can utilize for debt service payments and the state of texas said hey we're giving you tax relief on your mno but we're changing the rules for the debt services and so you have to whatever the debt services is the money you have in those coffers and then your tax rate for your debt services is the formula the you can't pay it off early can't extend it. That's, well, that, well that's you can't. You can pay. Oh, you can't. Can, excuse you, me. Okay. You can refund debt, and you can defease debt if the opportunity arises. Okay. Right, sir. With, well, with, the, with the funds and the debt service. Yes. But okay. the significant difference from this chart to where we are today is 
the issuer contribution line is the line that we can no longer have. So you can see that the reason that our, our right. tax rate was to be 24 cents is because we were going to be writing a $10 million check into that to buy the tax rate down. That is what we are no longer allowed to do. Now, rather than take that 10 million and spend it in salary or other places, you all have made that decision that the 10 million will be used for capital maintenance fund to avoid future debt. That's the reason for the change. It has nothing to do with the future bond at all. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Rice. All right, gentlemen, everyone's call the question. Is that a call the question? Okay. So we have a motion. We have, second. We have a motion and a second. We have a motion. We have a second. Mm -hmm. Are we voting on both propositions at this point, or just yeah. one? You're voting on the election order that's at your place. Well, you're going to call the election for November fifth is presented in that order. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion, second. We have discussions. Gentlemen, all in favor? Motion passes. Thank you, gentlemen. All right, item uh, 7C, consider approval of joint election agreement with Montgomery County. This is a familiar item for you all. We've just called an election for number, November 5th. As you know, we are required to participate in elections with other governmental entities. And so this is the agreement with the county that will allow us to participate in the election with other entities holding elections on November 5th. And I would ask that you approve it. Gentlemen, I move we approve as presented. Mr. Thank Sanders, you. Mr. Husbands, all um, discussion? All in favor? Motion passes. All right, item 7D, consider approval of the election service agreement with Montgomery County. And this is another agreement. This is the agreement with uh, Susie Harvey, the Montgomery County Elections Administrator, to run our election for us. She does, as you know, an outstanding job, and we would ask that she uh, run our election again this time. So moved. Mr. Second. Moore, Mr. Uh, Sanders, discussion? All in favor? Motion passes, gentlemen. With that being said, I have a motion to adjourn. Thank you.